Have you ever wondered why these two things, carbs and fat, or carbs and lipids, are just so tasty? Why are they so fattening, yet taste so good? Well, in this video, we're gonna look at the parts of carbohydrates and lipids, and talk about their chemical structure and their function, and maybe answer the question, why do they taste so darn good? Let's get started. So if you think about the word macromolecule, it really just means, right, larger molecules. Well, in living organisms, there are macromolecules that make up all living things. So remember back to one of our earlier videos when we said that atoms make up molecules. Molecules make up then larger macromolecules. That's the discussion for today. These larger macromolecules, of course, make up organelles, which make up cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We want to focus, though, in this video right here on macromolecules. Now, there are four macromolecules that we'll talk about. Today, we want to focus on just two of them. So, the macromolecules are lipids. When you think lipids, think fats. Carbohydrates, carbs, right? Proteins and nucleic acids. So these are the four classes or four major macromolecules that we will be talking about. Today though, in this video, we're focusing on these two, lipids and carbs. So, before we really get into the specifics of lipids and carbohydrates, we want to talk about, in general, how do you make a macromolecule? Well, how do we build large things? Probably from smaller things. So to make a macromolecule, we generally start with smaller molecules. Uh, and a fancy word for making a larger chemical would be a polymer, right? Poly, many units, many parts. So we do this, we build macromolecules by what we call a dehydration synthesis reaction. So if you take the word, you take the chemical reaction apart, synthesis, we're synthesizing, we're making something, and dehydration, that probably means water's gonna be involved. If it's dehydrated, maybe even removed. So that's in fact what happens. So we can take monomers or simple units, single, mono, remove some water, join them together and make larger molecules. So here's an example. Let's say we've got this molecule here, right? And we have this molecule here. Now, if the body, for whatever reason, wanted to join these two together, maybe it needs to build, you need to grow, you need to make some large molecules. Well, what can happen is water can be removed and these can join together. So let's see, where could we get a water? Hmm, I've got an oxygen, oh, look right here. Oxygen, two hydrogens. If these are removed, then there'll be some free electrons ready to bond. And that's exactly what happens. Water is removed, these come out, and the resulting, what's left, join together with a bond, right there, and we make a larger molecule. <clears throat> so this is essentially building how to make a larger molecule the reaction is called dehydration synthesis because we dehydrated it, we removed the water, and we synthesized a larger molecule. This will require some energy and enzymes. We don't get into that really in depth right here, so uh, tune into future videos for more of an explanation on how this takes place. So if we build polymers build major macromolecules, we also have to be able to break them down. So this is called a hydrolysis reaction. So this is the opposite of what we just looked at. A hydrolysis, if you think of the word lysis, right, to break or split apart, right? So lysis, we're splitting apart water and breaking down a polymer. We're going to use that to break down. So we'll use this water to break apart these larger uh, molecules into monomers. Now, why would your body need to break down large molecules? 
Oh, of course, right, digestion. So when you go out, you eat something, you have a big meal, then you have these large molecules that need to be broken down into smaller molecules so your body can use them. So here we go, we've got a large molecule here, right? If we're gonna break this down, we probably need to break one of these bonds, right? One of these bonds need to break so that we can go into smaller molecules. So how we do that is basically the opposite of what we just did in the previous example. Water comes in, right? And then we'll break one of these bonds as this breaks apart. The OH will go to one side, the hydrogen will go to the other, and we will now have two smaller molecules from that one larger polymer that we began with. So you can see, here's the OH on one and the H. So basically we just use this water molecule Half of it went there, half of it went there to the ends of this, these new molecules, all right? So those are the general reactions for how we build and break apart polymers. So let's get a little more in depth into the first class or the first major macromolecule, carbs. When you think carb, right, you think sugar, you think bread, pasta, but I like for you to really think sugar more. Even though, yes, we don't think of maybe pasta being sugary, it actually is, right? It has, it's made up of lots of simple sugars joined together. So what are in carbs? If you look at the name, carbohydrate. So there's probably some carbogen, carbon, there's probably some oxygen, and probably some hydrogen. And that's what it is. So these atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, are in carbohydrates. And this is one of our most simple carbohydrates. This happens to be glucose. And this is in the ring form. Remember that there are carbons at all these little ends that you just don't necessarily see. What is the function? Energy. Carbohydrates are a form of energy for us, right? Living organisms need energy. It's one of the properties of life. So we need carbohydrates for energy. Well, what are carbs made of? I told you, think of carbs as simple sugars. So um, what you see here, simple sugars are monosaccharides. Mono, one, saccharide, think sugar. So the monomer, the basic unit of carbs are simple sugars. <clears throat> and what do we know sugar is used for? Of course, to make energy. And right here, you can see, maybe you remember from a previous class, this is ATP, which is our form of energy that's being made ultimately from these carbohydrates. So let me give you some examples. Um, glucose is a monosaccharide. Fructose is a monosaccharide. You see it's just one sugar, one sugar. So we've got lots of different types. Glucose, I already gave you it as an example. We also have more complex carbohydrates. These are called polysaccharides, and we'll look at that in detail in a moment. This one happens to be cellulose, right? This forms a lot of the structure and support for plants. And basically what it is, if you look at it, it's just a bunch of these simple sugars put together, right? There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Lots of simple sugars put together to form these more complex sugars, okay? So there's the overview of carbs. Think carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So also one thing I want to mention is that in these carbon rings, I mentioned to you that generally at the corner are all these carbons, but we also number them, and this will come in handy later. So we start with the first carb carbon, generally the one on the inside. This, In this case, it happens to be an oxygen, so we wouldn't number that one. So we'll start our numbering system here from the inside and sort of work our way out. So this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth carbon. We'll get into more details on this later as we move and we start looking at more advanced macromolecules, but it is important that you learn that the carbons generally we number in these larger molecules. So I said there are lots of different carbs. Let's look at a few different types. So the first one, the most simple, would be monosaccharides. Mono, one, sugar. So here's some examples, right? Glucose, once again, you see it, 
fructose, there's another example. And so you see, this is just a simple sugar. This is a simple ring. Here's another simple ring. And in these cases, look, you see one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. This one's numbered, how like, like I told you. Here, for, even though they're not written out, you can remember there are carbons there. So we see, once again, we see six carbons. So monosaccharide, one sugar. Well, what do you think disaccharides are? Of course, two sugars. So here's some examples, sucrose, table sugar, right? This is the sugar we generally buy at the store and put on our food or in our food. Sucrose is basically just two monosaccharides put together. This little thing right here is called a glycosidic bond or glycosidic linkage. And it just bonds these two monosaccharides together. So sucrose is an example. Lactose, milk sugar, is also a disaccharide, right? You've heard of maybe people having lactose intolerance. That's because they don't have the enzyme lactase to break down that bond. So we got monosaccharides, one sugar. We got disaccharides, two sugars. And then the third type would be poly, polysaccharides, or many sugars put together. And here's some examples, right? Cellulose I mentioned earlier, that's in plants. Starch also can be in plants, right? You think of a starchy potato. And so these are some examples. And if you look really close, they're just simple sugars put together. Now, the, the way they're they arranged is important, and we'll look at that right here. So here's the polysaccharides. There are really four that I want you to really think about. There are two that function in energy storage, and there are two that really serve as building blocks or structure in terms of their function. So the two that we think of as energy storage, right? These are sort of more long-term energy storage for animals or living organisms to use later. Starch in plants, right? If you think about a potato or a tuber, why is it so starchy? Why does it taste so good? Well, what it's doing is it's storing energy for the potato plant. Stores it down here, keeps it safe. And basically, it just links a bunch of those little sugar molecules together so that it has some storage, some energy for later if it needs it. So we see starch in a lot of plants. Animals, humans in this example, we store our extra sugar in the form of glycogen in the liver, right? So, and this is, you can see it, it's kind of branched out. You can see all these small, if you really zoom in there, you can see these are just small little sugars, small little sugars. And so when we have too much blood sugar or glucose in our body, the body signals for that extra glucose to go and be stored in the liver as glycogen. And then if we need it later, just break it back down into glucose. So those are for energy storage. In terms of structure or building materials, think of in plants, cellulose, right? Cellulose, which makes up these cell walls, right? If you look at a plant and look at its cell wall, it's got this sort of rigid cellulose pattern that forms and it really serves as structure for the plant, gives it some structural support. So cellulose is another example of a polysaccharide. And then a fun one, I think, is chitin. That's pronounced chitin. And we see this in mushrooms and fungus, but the interesting thing to me is this is what makes up the hard structural part of the insect's exoskeleton. So if you ever were to step on a bug and you hear that kind of crunch, that's because of the chitinous structure that is in these arthropods and insects. So, just to review this slide a little bit, in terms of polysaccharides, these are carbohydrates, carbs, that have many sugars. We got starch in plants for energy. We got glycogen in animals for energy. We've got cellulose in plants for structure. And we've got chitin in arthropods and fungi for structure. So the second class, that we want to talk about, right? So we went all through carbs. When you think carbs, you think energy, 
Well, when you think lipids, I often think fat, right? Butter, olive oil, these are fats. So what are lipids made of? Well, they're actually made up of basically the same thing that carbs are made of, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? So there's lots of carbs, lots of hydrogen, lots of oxygen in these lipids. And we do see phosphorus in some phospholipids. So we'll look at those here in a minute. Here's an example. Here's a triglyceride. And remember back to my video, all of these are just carbon chains, okay? So what's the function of lipids? Well, also energy. We also know fats can be insulation, and some lipids are indeed steroids. Now, an interesting property about lipids is that they are nonpolar, okay? So they're hydrophobic. They don't mix well with water, right? You ever drop some fat or some oil in water? Doesn't mix well because it's nonpolar. Well, what are lipids made of? What's their basic unit or their monomer? Well, lipids are actually one, the, the one of the four that don't polymerize, meaning they don't form these really long chains, right? This is about as long as the chain as we see here in this triglyceride. So their monomer is a glycerol and some fatty acid chains. So if you look up here, this is the glycerol portion. And here are our fatty acid chains, okay? They're just long chains of carbohydrates. So let me give you some examples. Triglyceride, as you see here, one, two, three fatty acid chains and a glycerol molecule. You've probably heard of triglycerides, your HDL numbers, right? The good fat and the bad fat in your body, the triglycerides. Phospholipids, which will have a phosphate group at the head and some lipid tails, as well as steroids. Now, this one looks completely different than these others, but it is still technically a lipid, still a fat. And if, if you remember the last video, we talked about testosterone and estradiol. Oh, they looked very close, right? Steroids. So, I said I'd go into a little more depth about phospholipids. What are they? Well, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, what did I just say? Well, if you think about it, phospholipids are kind of special. Lipids in general are nonpolar and hydrophobic, but phospholipids are special because they have different parts. They've got this phosphate head and they've got these tails. The tails are hydrophobic, right? They do not like water. So these tails here are hydrophobic, but this head this phosphate head is hydrophilic, so it's okay with water, right? When it sees water, it's like, fine, I'm good with that. That's supposed to be a smiley face. So the hydrophilic head, which is basically just a phosphate, right? If you look at, you've got the P, the phosphorus, and the oxygens around it. That's hydrophilic, okay being close to water. The tails, hydrophobic, they don't like it. So how is this beneficial to living things? Well, believe it or not, these phospholipids make great membranes, okay? Membranes, if you think about it, they need to do two things. They need to be able to touch the outside, right? Where there's probably lots of water, lots of H2O, okay, floating around. And these hydrophilic heads, which you see there, are good with that. They can touch water, but we don't necessarily want the water just to go through. So the center part, these tails that you see, are hydrophobic. No water really can be in there. So this is how they naturally orient themselves. So these phospholipids form membranes by layering themselves with the hydrophilic head on the outside and the hydrophobic tail in the center. And you see it will make these nice lipid bilayer, one, two, bi layer because we've got one side here, one side there. Now I want to point out one more thing before we wrap this up. Do you see how this fatty acid chain is just all simple, a straight line? This particular one has a double bond there. And if you remember, 
each of these has a carbon and hydrogens out, right? Carbon and hydrogens, carbon and hydrogens. Well, this one, because there's a double bond, it has l one less hydrogen there, right? You see it's got, some, it's got fewer hydrogens than this one. So we say that this one is completely saturated with hydrogens, saturated with hydrogens. This one is unsaturated with hydrogens because it's got fewer hydrogens. So this one is a saturated fatty acid chain. This one is an unsaturated fatty acid chain. It sort of kinks out to the side, and that's the unsaturated, and you can see it here once again. So this would be the unsaturated fatty acid chain, and this would be the saturated fatty acid chain. So I hope that's a good introduction for carbs and lipids for you. Go, let's go back to our original question. Why are carbs and lipids so tasty? Well, it all goes to their function. What is their function? Energy. And what do animals need? Energy. So we have grown an attraction and affinity for sugary carbs and fatty lipids because they give us the energy we need.